Okay, so today's topic is about VCD, so VC dimension. We're going to talk about that in details. Let's just um, start from where we left off last week. So we were talking about the, the, the generalization using union bound, right? So we were talking about if we have M bins or M hypotheses, what's going to happen to the trade-off between your in-sample error and out-of-sample error. And we, we talked about the fact that if we are increasing M's, if we have more and more complex or more variety of hypotheses, uh, the delta G, which is the difference between your in-sample error and, and out-of-sample error, your test and training set, will increase. But on the other side, although these increase, your in-sample error, which was the training, is going to decrease. So if you have a fixed number of data points, right, you had your, your big set of D, With, with data points x1 and if they had labels y1 up to xn, right? So if we fix n to a fixed number of points and then we increase the number of hypotheses in our model, we're going to see that we're going to gradually start to increase the delta g, which is the difference between the absolute value of e in minus e out, right? But on the other hand, your E out generally is going to increase after you are having adding more and more, more and more M because uh, you're adding more complexity to your, to your model, right? On the other side, if you fix M, right, say we fix M to only two hypotheses. So our model is not that complex. It's just a linear model, for instance, right? And keep, we keep adding training examples. Okay, for a given hypothesis, we need more complex, uh, complex hypothesis, right? And so we have a very complex, uh, you know, hypothesis, but we don't have. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, we don't have a, a, a very complex hypothesis, but we have more and more ends, right? So when we have more and more ends, and we don't have any more com complex hypothesis, we are underfitting our, our model, and that's why we are having these two exchange here, right? By fixing n number of data points in our training example, if we carry on adding m, we're going to go overfitting. On the other side, if you are fixing n, I'm sorry, if you are fixing m, the number of hypotheses or multi-bins, and then we keep increasing n, we're going to have overfitting because our model is going to, uh, you know, have to have more number of n in order to handle the the more complex features, okay? So that was where we left off, using union bound. Also, we knew that using pack learning, right, in-sample error can be computed just by a simple, in the case of classification, by sample summation of overall those uh, identity uh, function of those misclassifications, right, inside your training examples, and E out would be the a probabilistic model, depending on the number of uh, samples you use in your test uh, set, you would have to just count them and make the probability out of those, okay? All right, we define again, it, it's, it's a recap that uh, delta G was the difference between your training uh, error and your test error, right, for G. The other fact that we talked about was we normally use edges, our different hypotheses, from capital H, the set of all hypotheses, before we observe the data, but after uh, picking the best one, which was the G, the best performance or best performing edge, we normally want to make sure that G sees the, the data set, right? And we also mentioned that in, in real world, normally we have infinite number of M's, although union bound was more likely to just have a good, uh, provide us a good upper bound for a finite case. So the case, the, the, and, and that was the case for union bound, right? We mentioned that if we add M, it's going to make it a weak upper bound because we're just adding, multiplying M to, to the fact. So there is a reason why union bound is not a good approach because if M goes to infinity, 
this approach doesn't generalize, right? So for instance, you have three M's. H1, H2, and H3, right? By using a union bound and Hefting's inequality, we are just multiplying those areas, so adding all these three together, right? But in reality, we are not just estimating it very weakly because the fact that we could have just observed this chunk instead of three of these, right? Mul three multiply those edges. So that was why union bound was a weak upper bound for our generalization case. All right, and also the fact that it wasn't addressing the case if M was you know, going towards infinity, right? All right, so we needed to come up with another solution for that. And that's the bulk of the, the, uh, the lecture today. We're going to see how we're going to derive to another uh, better sort of bounding for gross function that is called VC dimension. All right, let's have a um, small example here. So assume that your set of D, right, you have on, on the left side of X2, all minuses, the class of minuses, okay? On the side of x2 greater than zero, so this side, we have pluses, the class of pluses, all right? So let's just focus on one hypothesis, which is h1, okay? h1 classifies that whatever it was on this side, right? It's going to be positive. Whatever it was on this side, it was negative. Okay. However, it is classifying based on the fact that we have some samples. Our training example was placing it here. Right? We have a bunch of training examples here as positive. Bunch of training examples where they're as negative. Okay. And H1 hasn't seen all of the D based on this training example, it decides and say, okay, I'm just gonna put my classifier H1 here. So if H1 places here and we have these training examples, what's gonna be the in-sample error for H1? Zero. Zero. Why zero? So yes, so given this training example and the way H1 sees this and it's gonna train itself for that, uh, the, the training error is zero, right? It is co correctly classifying it. So let's talk about H2. So if we have the same training error, uh, training sample, and then we use H2, what's going to be the in-sample error of H2? Still zero, right? So both cases are, on that iteration of training, they're going to just come up with a, a, a correctly classified, and then they're not going to change their margin, right? They're going to stay there. However, Looking at the capital D, where we had all our uh, samples, right, that perhaps somewhere in the future some might draw some test samples from this D, we're going to have a huge problem in this shaded area for H1, and even for H2 it's going to be even bigger, right? So the fact that in sample error of H1 is zero, however, out of sample error of H1, given the fact that D was placing it left and right to the H, uh, x2, the probability of falling in blue region is very large, right? So the, the probability of falling in, in that bad news is very large. And this is also true for h2, even, even worse, right? So we can say the data set D that h1 hasn't seen is bad for itself, right? D is bad for h1. Also, D is bad for h2, and many other hypotheses that are all here, perhaps, right? So how are we going to find a relation between in-sample error and out-of-sample error, given this fact? Okay, And this is the bulk of the, the lecture today. Because H1 thinks, so let me just so D has this is D, okay? So these are all in D. H1 thinks based on this training example, then this that 
this is positive, this is negative, so I'm just placing my classifier here, right? However, if somebody draws something here or here or for H2 even here, so we're gonna have a, we're gonna have an issue for the case that H1 and H2 will, will be misclassified a point. Okay. No, I'm 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 not saying that that's the only bad region. There are multiple bad regions, and that's why we say D is bad for H1 and for other hypotheses, including H2, right? So so that that was just a, just a simple case that you see sometimes using trained examples, we cannot generalize easily to you know to testing examples, right? Because the fact that your hypothesis H hasn't seen overall D. If it was seeing overall D, it wasn't an IID anymore, right? So, and, and that, that's the issue in machine learning. We want to make sure we find a way to have a trade-off between underfitting, overfitting, and right choices of M and M, right? Okay. So, the key idea was that the union bound is not the right way of counting, right? Say by having M of those hypotheses, we were just multiplying their areas of probability, right? And we would have a very, very high and overestimated upper bound for our, uh, you know, model complexity, okay? So we were saying that delta H is greater than a value called epsilon. So for that matter, the, the delta... So the, the delta G, uh, so this is the difference between each of those hypotheses in training and testing is going to be within an epsilon uh, value, right? So we have, if you want to compute this for in-sample error and this one for the out-of-sample error, we can expand it. And then we're going to see that H, the function H, or the hypothesis function, depends on E in only through those edges, those points that was seen at the point of training, right? Not those points outside the training example. And that was the issue for that. Okay? So we need to find a way to find the effective number of hypotheses on a sample size of n. Let's call that m h of n, right? The number of effective hypotheses on a number of sample size n. Because we might have many, many hypotheses, h1, h2, up to hn, but a few of those were actually effective for our model, right? Can we, can we based on number of n, can we find number of effective hypotheses, right? And that's the question for now. So answering that question, there is a notion in machine learning called dichotomy. So dichotomy is, um, because of its name, it's sort of representing a duality. Because in, in, in linear classification, we are dealing with the output of plus one or minus one, right? So let's see what, what's a definition of a dichotomy vector. So let's assume x1, x2 up to xn, allowing the dimensional space of R, and all of them are fixed point, okay? So we have some points in the space. And let us assume hypothesis H is from the set of big... Uh, hypothesis set, right, be some hypothesis. And it's going to map those points to an output of plus 1 or minus 1. It's a linear classification, so the output of that hypothesis is going to tell you if this is a point that can be classified as one, minus 1 or plus 1, right? The class 0 or class 1, okay? So, assuming that we're going to have that hypothesis function iterating over all of our points that we have here as fixed point, right? Hypothesis 1, H, X1, H, X2, and all of those uh, similarly, uh, so we're going to have an output that maps to minus 1 and plus 1 by the number of their endpoint, right? It's endpoint space of a binary. 
So it's the evaluation of right that function. Okay. So we can define a dichotomy vector as the collection of all the binary vectors generated by H seeing those fixed points. Right? So if we have say three hypotheses, H1, H2, and H3, three classifiers. And we have three points, X1, X2, and X3, right? Given the placement of the points in that d-dimensional space, we're going to have H1, X1, H1, X2, H1, X3, right? Minus 1 and plus 1. Then we have H2, X1, H2, X2, H2, X3, and they're within minus 1 and plus 1. And also we have H3 for these points, right? So we want to make sure that when we count the final values of those outputs of the hypothesis, which are indeed minus 1 and plus 1, we have a unique number of those. So say we had 100 hypotheses and that three points, right? What would be the effective number of outputs of applying those hypotheses, right? Because many of those might lead to the same output. So we want to make sure we cross them out. If like H2, the, the output of H2, X1, H2, X2, and H2, X3 was the same as these, so we only consider one case for that. So we're going to cross this out, right? We want to make sure that we find the effective number of vectors that are generated by the output of each of those hypotheses. Okay? And that's why we call this a dichotomy vector. Let's have an example to, to, see the, um, to visually see the case. Okay? So in order to see this, when you look at this optimization in, in this, um, this space with a bunch of fixed points, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, okay? This is one hypothesis, right? Let's call this one, H1. H1 correctly classifies these points into blue and purple region, right? What if we weren't seeing this in class in, in, in colors? It's as if we were just having a opaque cover, a black sheet or a black cover covering this space. Right? And whatever we saw was some puncture, so we were punching out these points out of that black cover or that opaque sheet, okay? So by punching those, we would only see those points, okay? We didn't see any hypothesis or any colors at that point. How many different ways we could have classified these by switching each of those minus one and plus one? Assuming each of those are getting minus 1 and plus 1, what is the effective number of hypotheses I need at least to classify this space for me? Why? Yeah, that's pretty close. Good. Any more? All right. So your, your, your colleague had a very good estimate. Let's see how this turns out. Okay. So for that example, as I mentioned, we're going to place uh, a cover on top of the, the, the space, right? And we just punch those hole, punch some certain holes on, this, on the position of the points, right? In this case, we have three points. Say we have x1, x2, and x3. Okay. So we have n equal to 3, 3 points. And we have only two dimensions, x1 and x2. All right? So as we sweep all the values of h inside the capital H, the, the set of hypo hypotheses, we're going to observe that the, the output of the uh, hypothesis h is going to be still within minus 1 and plus 1 of the order of 3, because we have 3 points, right? Many outputs are going to be equal, right? Our number of hypotheses is infinite, but 
but dichotomies, those set of minus 1 and plus 1 are limited. Let's see how that turns out here. So, effectively, we see that if we count those vectors that are coming from each of those hypotheses, h1 of x1, x2, x3, h2 of x1, x2, x3, and hm of x1, x2, x3, right? Many of those outputs are going to be the same, so we remove them, right? And the effective number, although the h is infinity, infinite hypothesis we can have here, right? Many lines we can draw. However, the effective number of hypotheses are always smaller or equal to 8. And as your colleague mentioned, to the raise of 3, right? Let's see a better example to visualize this here. Let's just, before that, let's just have another definition for that. So we can have a shattered hypothesis given the fact that if the hypothesis set of H has exactly the value of 2 to the raise of N, okay? The number of those dichotomies, if they are exactly 2 to the raise of N, we're going we're gonna to mention that that space was shattered by that hypothesis set, okay? So this is another definition for that, okay? Let's see why. I'll, I'll go back to this uh, example. Now, let's just start with three points. We have three points. We have a number of edges. All of them are linear classifiers, right? Perceptron case. Let's just start with this one. On the first case, I have three points. Let's see what are the number of values each of those can get, OK? This is x1, x2, and this is x3. On a first example, if all of those were pluses, right, I could have been easily classified this with one perceptron, right? If all of them are pluses. I'm just going to place a line here, perhaps, OK? So do you agree with me that the first line is OK? All good? OK. Now. Let's tweak a little bit the third one. So still x1 and x2 are holding a plus value while I switch back x3 to minus. Okay, if this is the case, can I classify this with one perceptron, which comes from this sine function? You already saw that. Is it possible? So I'm just going to put perhaps a line here. So that would be still okay. What if I keep this one plus, right, switch this one to a negative class, and this one a plus. Is it still okay? Right. So we can still classify it this way. And in fact, for these three points that are not collinear, just like this example, all of those two to the raise of n permutations of pluses and minuses, you had three, so you have eight outputs, right? For all of those iterations, you had a distinct dichotomy set, right? And that's why the number of those sets that are coming from the output of the edge, which was indeed a, a linear classifier, is going to be 8. And by definition, since we mentioned that if the value was exactly 8, we're going to assume that this was a shattered hypothesis. So for this case, we say for these three points, placing out this way, the space was shattered by the, uh, by the hypothesis for three points. Okay. Can anyone um, talk about the, the, the second example in the middle? Okay. Go. Mm -hmm. So all pluses are fine. Our minuses are fine. What else? So like minus minus and plus plus. Same thing for x3. Same thing for x3. Uh, minus minus plus plus. That's right. That's right. 
So we had three points. This placement is called collinear, so they were, they were placing it, those points collinearly. The maximum number of permutations of different distinct values would be still 8, 2 to the raise of 3, which was 8. But because of the placement of x2 in the middle, if this one becomes another uh, distinct value regarding to x1 and x3, there's no way I can, sh I can classify the space correctly with just one perceptron that I have in my definition, right? So I'm just going to lose, and for both classes, if it was minus and the, the rest were pluses, or if it was pluses and the rest were um, minuses. So I'm going to lose two instants out of my eight, right? So the final answer for this would be six, because these two are not supported, this one and its uh, dual case, right? So the number of edges the distinct value of the edge function in this case would be 6. And since 6 is smaller than 2 to the raise of n, so that the, we're going to say that this hypothesis, the edge does not shatter for these three collinear lines. Okay? All right. So now on the third example, we have four lines. So let's, let's have some analysis for that. Mm -hmm. So if two are, these two are pluses, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. So if if the the placement would be uh, pluses on on the the extreme side of uh, x two and x one and minus on the other side and the dual case, we're not able to just you know using one perceptron, we're not able to classify this. So we had four points, two to raise of four was 16, so we're going to lose two samples, two instances out of those. So finally we say that for 14 cases, we have distinct dichotomy vectors, okay? You might have a million or a billion or an infinite number of hypotheses, but it doesn't matter because their distinct value is, is going to be only 14 case, right? That's the way to characterize the complexity of... Um, a growth function, right, for these four points. And since it's not 2 to the raise of 4, it's smaller, so we say that H does not shatter for four points in this example. Okay, is it clear? So now you see that for this dichotomy set seems more promising in order to uh, find an upper bound for the complexity of your problems, right? We don't just have to make the union and you know multiply them by m which was the size of hypothesis we can do better in this case okay so using um, that dichotomy said it turns out that the existence of a breakpoint is very important properties right so using that we can you can define a growth function here. Okay. Well, actually, let me just go the other way around. Let's have this slide sooner. All right. So two uh, mathematicians, um, Vapnik and Chervonenkis. Uh, Vapnik is still alive, so he's one of the well-known researchers um, in, mach in the statistical machine learning. Um, he was the, the inventor of um, support vector machines and many other things. I guess Cher, uh, Chervonenkis passed away recently. Uh, but in 1971, they used this dichotomy set notion and they found uh, a formulation for a better upper bound of complexity of machine learning models, right? They defined let n be an integer such that, so we have the value n of our point, that m of h of n right, it's going to be 2 to the raise of n, and if we plus one point, we add one point to n, the output would be smaller than 2 to the raise of n plus 1, right? So using these two, we're going to, we're going to find out that n is, a, is the VC dimension of h. That's why 
they call it BCD sometimes, it stands for that dimension, Papnik uh, Chervonenki's dimension. So in general, BCD is the largest number of points shattered by H, right? Or on, on the other, uh, if, if you want to take a look at it from the other side, BCD is going to be the smallest number of K that is uh, a breakpoint minus 1, okay? We can also represent it this way. VC dimension of H is going to be equal to N because if you increase N with just 1, you're not going to be able to shatter the space anymore, okay? So for the linear classification example, we just saw previously, if the points are not collinear, your M of H of three points, right, is going to be eight. For four points, no matter how, how you place them, you're going to be still having 14, okay? Thus, we're going to say that D4 is a breakpoint, okay, for BC dimension of H equal to three. Is that clear? Any questions? You got why D4 is the breakpoint on this case? Because on the case of 3, MH of 3 is going to be up to 2 to raise of N, which is 8, right? But if we add 1 to N, N plus 1, which is going to be 4, it's going to be smaller than 2 to raise of N plus 1, which was 16. Now it's 14, right? Thus, we're going to say that N is a VC dimension of H, or a breakpoint. And a breakpoint is, is always uh, one subtraction from the VC dimension. So we're going to say 3 is going to be the breakpoint of that. So, yeah, so, 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 so for tr if, if, if they are collinear of, of, or not, I mean, you, you have to, it, it depends on the problem. Right, it depends. Yeah, you cannot generalize by not seeing them. Yeah. But that, that's the upper bound of that. Yeah. Uh, so here for n equals 3, we can say like 3 is the VC dimension of the diverse. Uh, when you say that then n is the VC dimension of H, mm -hmm. so when we have like m of h of 3, which is equals 8, so we say 3 is the vc dimension of h. Yes. So, is, is this true for all possible? Yes, because it's, it's going to give you an upper bound, right? You don't care how many hypotheses were there inside. Right, but like, there's no arrangement of for four points, you play around with any four points. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But the four points are Still, you have problems. So like that would not be. But this is an upper case. bound. This is an, so it, the complexity of the model won't, won't be higher than this. It might be, you know, lower, right? This this is a gross function for the model. So we want we want to make sure we we are not uh, missing any upper bound. But if you are overestimating it. That's the issue of this bound. There are other bounds that we, we weren't having time, so it's called bias variance. So it, it, for many instances, they might give you a better estimate of the gross function, right? But this is doing much better than a union, union bound of the Hefting's inequality by just multiplying them to m, right? Um, what's the point of finding the break? Yeah, you're going to see that in 20 minutes. OK. So. So using a VC dimension and breakpoint, we're going to define growth function now. 
okay? Let's define m of h of n, right, as the maximum size of a vector, the number of distinct dichotomy sets, which was the output of your hypothesis, given your numbers, n, right? For linear classification in two-dimensional space, m3 is going to be 8, right? 4 points is going to be 14, and m of h of n it is smaller or equal than 2 to the n in general because of the, the dichotomy set in the classification problem, right? So it turns out that the existence of a breakpoint is very important, and the smallest value of a breakpoint is a measure of complexity, right? So we call this still that effective number of hypotheses because so many of them were having the, the, the same output, so we could have just crossed them, okay? And so as, as a definition, if you want to have a definition for breakpoint is if k is an integer such that m of h of n is smaller than 2 to the raise of k, k would be the breakpoint of your hypothesis set, okay? Now let's see how we're going to use that breakpoint. Now, sometimes by restrictions that was applied to the problem, we can find even a lower bound for the breakpoint. Let's see an example here. So assume that you were supplied with these two information. Let m of h of 1 was 2, okay, and m2 was 3. Find the max value of m of h of 3 in this case, okay. So now I have three points. I want to make sure I found the maximum number of effective hypotheses. x1, x2, x3. So basically this one for 1 is 2 is obvious because this can get either 1 or 2. So you have two distinct values for the dichotomy set. But for 2, it effectively means that for every two points, x1, x2, x1, x3, or x2, x3, right? The different number of permutations of those vectors should not exceed more than 3, okay? That, that is exactly what it's saying for us. So, for instance, if this one is plus, okay, and x2 is plus, and x3 is plus, it should be good. If this one is plus, the next one is minus, and this is plus. I have to see that, okay, for each of those two points, I have maximum effective number as 3. So this is 1, plus, plus, and plus, minus. So I'm good on x1 and x2. Let's consider x1 and x3. I have plus, plus, and plus, plus. I'm still 1. I'm good. Let's consider x2 and x3. I'm plus, plus, is 1. I'm minus, plus, is 2. I'm still good. I can go on. Right? I'm going to make it plus, another minus, and another minus. Okay? So these two are still two combinations because it's plus, 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 minus. So on this side, I'm still two. On this side, I'm two. And three. So this is still okay. But if I want to go one step higher, right? If I go minus, minus, and plus, now what's going to happen here? On the side of x1 and x2, I have pluses, I have minuses, it's 2, and I have plus minus. So for these, I'm good. For x1 and x3, I have plus plus, plus minus, and minus plus. It's 3, is still good. However, x2 and x3 will, will uh, exceed the, uh, the limitation of 3. Because I have plus plus, minus plus, minus minus, and minus plus. So our full combination happened here. So this line is not acceptable. Okay? You see why? Why didn't you introduce the line before? Because you put them random, right? Yeah. So let's just have it. So this effectively says that for each of the two points, the number of effective hypotheses that are distinct, which we call it effective, should not be more than three. Right? So for each of those pluses and minuses, you need to consider each co-pair 
either this or this or this. And consider the fact that each of those combinations of the two points are not more than three. So this is okay. That was the first instance, second and third. However, this one will exceed because between x2 and x3, now you have four different outputs that are exceeding these three. Is it clear? Yeah. Did anyone understand? I have a question. Yeah. So in the first one, uh, the uh, MH of one, we have three combinations. Um, so it's exceeding two, right? MH of one is two. Yeah, it's two, uh, but we have three combinations here. So there's plus plus, plus minus, and minus minus. So that's also exceeding. Yes, yes. So it's exceeding in both the cases. Yes, yes, just... that's right. Yeah, oh, okay. for both information. Yeah, yeah. Can anyone describe why MH of 2 equals to 3 was hinting us that the fourth line is not acceptable, is out, outside the bounds? Because we have like three different, like we already had three different sets, so the last one would make the fourth. Mm -hmm. So wh why, why the fifth? Why well, the fifth one was okay? Uh, yeah, the fifth yeah, one was. That was the... actually my question, but I guess that's because uh, the third and the fifth are the same. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so essentially, you could get different answers from what you had if you. Yeah, if, if, if you had started another way, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's not a dis distinct answer, yeah. So, um, but it's going to slash our upper bound of the complexity of this model because we were told that MH2 is 3, MH1 is 2. So now when we have MH, we want to consider MH3, now three points altogether, because of that limitation, our upper bound of the growth function will be limited. And it's a good way to know how we're going to limit an upper bound, right, by just a breakpoint. Everyone got why? Got the answer? If you want to give, it, give out like an answer, like a number, what would you say? Four? For this case? Because you could add more, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we could have add more. But yeah, as you mentioned, the final answer here is, no matter how many hypotheses you use, given this provided information and the three x's, it appears that when mh2 is 3, the effective number of hypotheses, those distinct dichotomies, cannot exceed four. And that's the case you see. So no matter how you lay out those pluses and minuses, you won't have more than four different hypotheses. So you won't have any four different outputs, right? I know it sounds a little bit uh, heavy to grasp, but if you just think about it, it's going to sink gradually. <laughs> yeah. Are we missing some possible? Values on there though. So let's see. Which one we're missing? Like minus plus minus. Minus plus minus. Yeah. Yeah. That would be still not acceptable. Because after this these three points, after these four points that we accepted given this is starting, there are no more outputs that we can accept that, right? Because it's going to exceed the uh, MH2 equal to 3. But on the MH2 equals 3, we're assuming the first two points are X2 and X3, right? No, we have to take into account all the pairwise of all these three points. So X1 and X2, X1 and X3, and X2 and X3. Yeah, all of those pairwise. Because they're, they're talking about two points, right? For all the combination of two points, their different effective number of dichotomies should not exceed three. Should this, right? For any two points. So we have three points for each of two. That, that's why I mentioned here, you need, to, uh, you need to compute. So in three cases, it's going to be like the selection of three out of two, right? So you're going to have this, oh, so awful on this. So you're going to have either this, one case, gonna have, you, you have to consider all these cases, right? 
and the third one is this. Is this second line and the fourth are the same? Like the one that we did accept is it the same as the second one? Uh, what does it mean to be the same? I mean, we said we, we accepted the fourth one because it was just like the second one. No, we, 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 accept, like one. we could not accept the fourth one because up to that point, those pairwise uh, permutations of dichotomies were already exceeding three. So why did you accept the fourth? The, the if, if you want to accept fourth, we need to uh, we need to just cancel two two. Okay. If if you expand fourth sooner earlier than two, yeah, two would be the the, the one that you didn't accept. Okay. So the only so this is this is the reason we have breakpoint. We don't care how you place the, your points and how many hypotheses you have. This is going to show that depending on the points, right? Depending on the n, what's going to be the growth function of your training model, right? And this is a very good upper bound because we see, oh, I have this problem, MH1 is 2, MH2 is 3. So what's going to be for MH3 in this case? And, I show, and I'm sure that after 4, I don't have any more distinct dichotomies. So my growth function will have a breakpoint at 4, right? So it's going to make an upper bound to my current problem. So let's expand it to a million points and a more complex model like a neural network. So how are we going to use that in order to define a relationship between my E in and E out? So that's the reason we are using a, a VC dimension for that. All right, let's talk about the result of VCD now. So there are two major results by having a VCD, okay? So the first one says if your uh, set of hypotheses has a finite VC dimension, right? So the value was smaller than infinity. Then MH of N is bounded by a polynomial function in H. Uh, in N. So your M H of N is going to be bounded by a, a selection, right? Which we can call it N choose K, just like what you had in, in the previous example. It was 2 out of 3. So you're going to be bounded by um, a polynomial function in N. And that would be still n of the uh, VC dimension plus 1. So that means that once you have a breakpoint, the model complexity starts to grow very slowly. So after you surpass your breakpoint, your model complexity won't exceed as much as it was before reaching the breakpoint. And we're going to show that visually for you. Right? And just like the previous example, we had three points and two selections, right? So we're going to use n choose k for that. And this is basically the, the sum of all polynomial coefficients, okay? In previous example, we just saw, so n was 3, vc dimension was 1, mh of 3 was smaller than, of course, 0 of 3 and 1, 3, okay? Which was 4. Okay, you see why? You see that Mitchell was one, then we had N three. Oh no, actually, this is two. Yeah, I have up. up, up. Up to this slide, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, let's see. All right, so recall what we had in union bound in previous lecture, right? We mentioned that in union bound we have m of those, okay? And we need to just compute uh, the upper bound of the growth function differently. Now we're going to have another 
upper bound using VC dimension. And, and we're going to see in, in, in next slide why. Okay. In general, even before VC dimension, right, up to VCD, we got a linear increase due to the shattered in H, right? When we had, when we were trying to get a log of the growth function, right, it would be a log 2 of 2n and it would be smaller than n because it was going up exponentially, right? When we get the log, it's going to be linear. But the actual value of the growth function using VCD now is going to be a function bounded by a theta. So theta of dVc, VC dimension of h log 2n. It's as if when you have a growth function such as that, when you, you know, uh, when you plot that using the number of n in your x-axis and log 2 of uh, growth function, right? After just passing your breakpoint, you're going to see that instead of increasing linearly, which was the case before, now using VC dimension, the increase would be much slower by the order of theta of VC dimension. Okay? And that's the good point that VC dimension tells us that for large number of n, actually learning is possible. Otherwise, it would be, um, it would just explode the space and by having like billions and billions of points, you would just expand the space to the point that learning wasn't possible. Now we see that by defining um, a good upper bound such as VC dimension, learning is actually possible. Okay? Can you see the reason why here? All right, so that was the first major results out of VC dimension, which is after passing the VCD by the number of n's, it was defined, the growth function is going to go grow slowly. So it's lower than the log 2 of 2 to the raise of n. Okay, instead of that, it's going to grow by a theta function defined by VC dimension, which is a slower. So after this, it's going to be a slower. So your point were like two, three, four, five, six. So say it was eight. After eight, the growth will be slower. You wouldn't just go linearly in the log two to the raise of n. Okay. So the second result of VCD is using these two hyperparameters or our fixed parameters, k1 equal to four and k2 one over eight, we can define a probability of uh, differences between your in-sample and out-of-sample error, which we call it delta G, within an epsilon value, right, smaller than this value now. K1, mh of 2n, multiply e to the minus exponential. You recall previously, the bound here was 2m e to the raise of minus 2 and, uh, and 2. Okay, we were just multiplying all those m's in union bound. Now it's not a case anymore. So that was union bound. But now using VCD, we are having a better, more optimistic upper bound. And it tells us that for large number of n's, with infinite number of hypotheses, actually learning is possible. Otherwise, learning wouldn't be possible if we were just using uh, union bound, right? Because first of all, it wasn't addressing the, the case that m is infinite and secondly the growth function was like going uh, linearly so for very large ends learning wouldn't be possible okay now 
Let's put them all together and have a complete set of upper bound. So let's define this value as delta, right? So we're going to call with the probability greater than 1 minus delta, right? Those confidence levels that, that we talked about two lectures ago. We could say that the, the test error, the out of sample error of G is your training error plus some epsilon, right? That was within a range of epsilon. And we would define epsilon as 8 divided by n log 4m h 2n divided by delta. And this is smaller than this value, right, which is effectively a VC dimension of 2D. So we're going to call this a penalty term, this one. So using VC dimension, we can tell that your out of sample error, your test error, is within your training error plus some penalty terms that we can compute it this way, right? Sometimes they, uh, they're going to call this omega of h, n, and delta, right? So it's, it's, it's going to be a function of theta of this value, 8 over n, and that log value, okay? Either using VC dimension or using growth function, the same, right? So let's see how we're going to visualize this. Now, when the complexity of the model increases, in general, we would, we would have started from a very, very uh, efficient model and not a complex one, such as a linear model. And then we go to a polynomial order and second order and higher orders. And then we would start neural network and more complex models, say SVMs or other things. right? In general, we would see that in sample error, would decrease because your uh, your your training error is going to be decreased. You have a more complex model. You start from underfitting and then you go towards overfitting, right? And you would see that somehow your test error would decrease to the point that it's going to increase again, right? We wanted to make sure that we find where to stop when we train such models. So. Using this, we understand that at some point, our training error is small enough, but our test error is going smaller. But if we carry on training, the test error would decrease, uh, would be increase again. So we wanted to find out what's this point, okay? For for the right set of model, we wanted to find where to stop in training and test. And now, using VC dimension, we're going to say that. A rule of thumbs, you know, tells you, for instance, that if you have a million data points, okay, you can afford to have a more complex model with a higher VC dimension, okay. However, if you have a limited point, picking a complete, uh, picking a more complex model, is going to be leading you to overfitting, right? Say you have hundred data points in your training example, if you pick 20 layer deep neural network, you're going to overkill because you have only 110 or, or just 10 points. So you're going to have uh, overfitting issues. However, if you have a billion data points, it is it's worthwhile to, you, you have to pick a more complex model to elaborate all of those features of your training uh, set, right? It, it does make sense in, in real life because the, the higher the number of your training set, the more complex you should you know, have your training model, okay? So, and if you plot this, you're going to see that your training ex uh, training error is going to start high because you haven't trained your model. It's going to see more points, and it's going to go down, right? Your E out is going to decrease after you train your model, and then at certain point, actually, I, I should have put this one here. This was a better visualization. A certain point, you see that your in-sample error and your out-of-sample error are pretty close to each other, okay? And that's exactly where the point that VC dimension tells you, depending on the point, okay? So, in general, we can see that after points 
after VC dimension points, right, we're going to have overfitting. So for those points below that, here, it's going to be underfitting. Right? In practice, normally, we, we call 10 times a VC dimension as the number of points to pick for an algorithm. For instance, if you have, I don't know, 200 endpoints, right, your VC dimension should be around 20, okay? So that, that model complexity should be around 20, otherwise you, you're going to overfit or underfit that. In practice, we use that 10 to the number of VC dimensions as the number of ends, right? Does that make sense? I mean, this is just for a case of uh, we only covered the theoretical foundation of a classification problem. If you were to expand it in other complex models, the, the math would become more complex, and it was outside the scope of the course. So, like, generally, like, if, if we create a model, uh, then we create a VC dimension before, just to go to, to check the complexity, how much complex you want to go. Like yeah. First we have yeah. So, so now we have two, two parameters. One is M, the complexity of the model. The, the, the learning algorithm you want to pick, is it SPM, is it linear regression, is it neural network, right? And the other point is your N number of data points you want to train on, right? So using these two, you're going to have multiple trade-offs. You can use have things inequality, you can use a union of those if you have multiple Ms, or you can use VC dimension as, as a bound for your growth function. We didn't have time to ex explore the third option, which was bias variance, uh, but yeah, there are other options to bound the growth function of a learning algorithm. Okay. Is it, uh, say that again. What do you mean by type, type of data? Oh, by by yeah. I mean, so so regarding features and uh, number of data points, we had other formulations before in the class, if you recall. But now we are just we were just t uh, telling you about the type of learning algorithm and the number of data points you have, right? For sure, if you increase the features, you remember in, in pseudo inverse we were having some relations between the number of features and number of data points, right? That's another orthogonal way to this. Yeah. Any questions from VC dimension? Okay. If there is none, uh, I'll see you on Wednesday, and we're going to conclude the course with cross-validation and um, test sets. Okay? See you guys.